Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to my channel. If this is the first time you're watching New York Real Zoom, welcome. I'm Olive Hui. I'm here with intuition expert Becky Walsh. Becky is in the UK. I'm in New York City, but we are talking via Zoom. We talk about how to use intuition in our daily lives. Today we are focusing on relationships and love. How to read your lover. How do you use intuition uh, for a deeper connection, a deeper sexual experience? Yeah, it's a good one. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, you know when they say that you should talk to to your partner about what you want sexually. Yeah, have you ever tried that? Uh, well, guys it's, don't like I mean, to talk about it. <laughs> but can we like, not talk about? It? <laughs> can we not talk about it? We don't want to talk about it. Nobody wants to be criticized. We don't want to be told we're doing a bad job. Nobody wants to talk about it. So Because like, you know, even, even if you're trying to say something nice, then, then you know the next thing is like, okay, that is an issue, even though it's so great. <laughs> exactly. Here's a shit sandwich. But I prefer it if you pulled my hair. I prefer it if blah, blah, blah. But it's just, you know. So actually, I think it, it's so um, like that nobody else has complained before. It, it, it's just <laughs> a hot bed of getting into a right old argument. And actually there's a, there's a, a, a way kind of round it, um, which is difficult because what you really want to do is teach a lover to become more intuitive in, in bed. Mm. It's very hard to say, hey, <laughs> come and watch this video. Um, but, um, you know, have you ever felt like when you're making love to somebody that actually you're not sure if it's your orgasm that's building or their orgasm building, and then you discover it was their orgasm building and you feel like, or was that mine or, or was it? Or was it mine? And <laughs> it's true. Well, sometimes and, the other person affects you too, so it's kind of both, but you will check in to see how you feel and check in your partner with your partner. Yeah, it's like it, it, it's you know, and I mean, and I guess that this can also be where you can like actually have like that mutual orgasm, which is blissful. I mean, if you can actually kind of like both kind of come at the time, same time. it's just right. <laughs> Ah, it's like amazing. <laughs> and then you both lay back there wanting a tummy rub, you know, just, you know, for a cigarette or whatever it is that you're into. Um, but it's, it's, you can really feel because at the end of the day, our energy centers are combining and shifting and moving together. It's not just our bodies that are moving together, but our entire energy system. And I think in this modern world where women feel that they can act like guys, um, and I'm not saying that this isn't bad. Believe me, I've done a lot of acting like a guy. Um, you know, but we are always the host and a guy is always the guest. Hmm. And so as a, yeah, you know, think about it. It's like How do you apply like, this uh, to um, same, same sex relationships? It depends because with the same sex relationship, it's like, I think that women are always kind of like that, that, intimacy between two women can sometimes be a lot deeper because of the you know I mean penetration not by physical means apart from like your tongue or your fingers or mm. something like that but, you know it's a different thing but there's so much more intimacy beca because of of the uh I guess the the, the it's like more and more here because you're both you're both being receivers you're both receiving whereas when you when you've got a heterosexual relationship one's a giver one's a taker you know, and it can change and, and maneuver. And then also I think kind of like with, with gay relationships, there tends to be a tendency of one being preferable to the other, or some people can do both in there. There would still be host and guest. Yeah, so archetypally, you're still kind of like host and guest in an archetypal kind of way. Okay. So I think it kind of like applies in, in different ways. I think, you know, even actually, I think that, you know, so when we're talking about the, the difference between being the, the, the host and the guest, I think what I'm talking about here is openness and vulnerability. Uh -huh. It's always the person who is being penetrated has that deeper level of openness and vulnerability because gotcha. you know, it's quite scary. It's quite scary. You know, it's, you know, it's like it's not. We watch the animals. We know it's scary. <laughs> Well, if you're a fox, it's super scary. There's barbs, you know, that's really scary. But when it comes to us, I think that, you know, you can feel what it's like to be the guest and the host. You can open yourself up intuitively to all sorts of different levels of, of awareness. 
um, that isn't just about the awareness that is in your genitalia or the awareness of your energy system or the awareness of your skin, but actually the, the awareness of, the, of all of the interconnectivity that's actually happening on multiple levels, which makes you orgasmic on multiple levels. It makes you able to sense your partner's orgasm as if you're having it yourself. And one of the tips of doing this is actually using your chakra system. So, you know, for example, if you're giving oral sex and you just literally put your hand over the person's sacral chakra, which is about four fingers below the belly button, you can really get a sense of whether or not you're hitting the spot, <laughs> which wow. means that you don't have to go left a bit. Is that the, the chakra, it's both uh, true with male and female? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And also, apart from anything else, you've got some great muscles down there that tense them. You know, this kind of like little jerks that kind of happen as, as the waves are coming, you know, and you kind of like your stomach kind of jerks a little bit. It's, it's, it's almost like having contractions. As the person gets more and more towards the orgasm, the, the contractions build. So it doesn't mean that you can count, you know what I mean? Like lightning and thunder, you know, you can't kind of like count. Oh, well, we're four away now, you know, breathe. And <laughs> Feel that those if those contractions are getting shorter and shorter and shorter you know that you're building towards an orgasm if the contractions stop getting shorter and shorter you know you're missing the point you've that's moved. so interesting that is like giving birth yeah it kind of is and actually um some women do have an orgasm whilst they're giving birth i've seen wow. it on youtube so it must be true um, but I think that we lost an awful lot of the, you know, when the midwives uh, were killed through the witchcraft trials. I think we missed an awful lot of how to have stress free birth. And I know we're sort of slightly going on to a different subject here, but, you know, oxytocin is the drug that opens the cervix. Oxytocin is the love drug. If you are fearful, then of course you, there's no oxytocin if you're fearful. So the cervix doesn't open or doesn't open wide, which means you've got a lot more pain in childbirth than there would be. So actually, if you're being kissed and touched and caressed and your partner is being sexual with you and loving with you and connected to you, more oxytocin, bigger and wider the cervix goes. Oh. Childbirth. Hooray. But because we're so programmed with birth sucks, it's really painful, it's really awful, it's one of the worst things that can ever happen to you, you know, here, have an epidural. Um, we, we aren't in that love-based state where it happens easily. So this is why sometimes on YouTube um, you can find uh, yeah. women uh, being uh, stimulated by a man during childbirth because it creates the oxytocin. Right? Actually, I haven't heard of that. Wow. Wow. I mean, I've never had a child myself, so believe me, if all of you mothers are screaming at me right now, going, yeah, you try it. <laughs> all right. Sorry. <laughs> like, I'm sure, you know, but I do. Oh, I do interesting. Think, yeah, it's really interesting. So actually, the more we are connected with the person having chemicals of oxytocin, the more intuitively that I've changed the subject of childbirth. You, <laughs> You might not want to intuitively connect with someone giving birth. Believe me, I'm sure that's not so nice. <laughs> you, can, you can really intuitively feel your partner and therefore double the orgasms. Even if it's not yours, you're just sealing it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it um, the same with, say, a husband, a longtime partner, or a one-night stand, or someone in a new relationship? Because I know you talk a lot about being in a new relationship, and that's a very popular topic. It is. And, and I think um, being in, in a new relationship is kind of vital because you're really learning somebody else's body and everybody is different. Their likes and dislikes are different. You know, I mean, genitalia tends to kind of like work in pretty similar ways, but how we like to be touched and held and felt, you know, very different. Some, some of us have whole parts of our body. We just don't want to be touched. Mine is the top of my head. Drives me insane. <laughs> Don't touch the top of my head, just don't. And, you know, it seems very tribal, but lots of people feel like that. Or we have sensitivity <laughs> around back fat or whatever the, Whatever your problem I just, is. I did say something one time. I'm not a basketball. <laughs> I'm not a basketball. Get off my head. Like, you know, and whereas some women might, might like a little guidance. I really don't. Um, so we all have different ways in, in which we want to be touched and, and felt. And when we're in new relationships, that's super important. Mm. However, when we're in long-term relationships, we stop being curious. We think we've got it. You know, we think. Right. Oh, and then we start getting into this routine thing where we only do 
what we know our partner likes. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's boring because it's kind of like, you know, the final Position call. one, two, three, over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we kind of like go, actually, this is no longer my favorite position because we do it so much. I'm bored, you know. To become curious is a way of reigniting perhaps what we what we want you know, and what, what we need. And maybe we need to be able to listen more deeply um, to, to what our partner needs intuitively. Is Are they moving differently? Are they doing things differently? And also, it's a really good way of finding out if your partner's cheating. <laughs> because <laughs> when if your partner is sleeping with someone else while they're sleeping with you, they will be doing things differently. Something will change in their lovemaking patterns. There's a normalness of how you two make love that changes when they make love to somebody else. So then when they come back to making love to you again, you're like, whoa, hang on. This is different. This Something about it has changed. So that's also a good way of intuitively working out if someone's cheating. Although you may want to bring that up as a conversation after you've made love, not like during. <laughs> you know, maybe. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe that doesn't happen. <laughs> Modern people are so busy. So sometimes when you um, transition in back into your home life, you still have a lot on your mind. Like what is... Uh, what are good things to do to sort of clear that and to get back to that platform where both people are open to meeting and having a an intimate time? Yeah, sex is a meditation. It, it's a meditation. It's a mindfulness practice. It's like, and, and if you're not like being mindful, like if you're not fully present when you're making love, if you're thinking about your work day or something else, for a woman, it makes it really hard to have an orgasm. Because you really have to have a mindfulness connection with your clitoris to be able to have an orgasm. So if you're thinking, about, you, you, you know, you may have experienced it that, you know, you're in the middle of making love and, you, you know, you're really close to orgasm. And then you suddenly go, oh, my God, did I leave the oven on? Boom. It's like, <laughs> like your clitoris loses an erection and you're right back to square one. You're having to rethink everything through again. And so it's a it's a meditation mindful practice you have to be completely in the moment which means that all of the you know um positive benefits that come from mindfulness and meditation um can be done whilst making love which means woohoo great multitasking um so you know there's lots of people who are talking about how when it comes to mindfulness it actually shrinks that part of the brain i think it's called the amygdala that is actually responsible for our stress levels and for the chemicals that are released by stress so it actually brings us into a better state of well-being and is a really great antidote to a lot of our stressful lives the other thing that's interesting is a woman's arousal starts before sex most of the time in, in long-term relationships, it starts during sex. So oh. quite often we'll say, I'm not in the mood to, to, to have sex. Well, no, of course you're not, because you're not being stimulated. You're still in your working day. You're in a different mindset. Sometimes it actually needs to be instigated and then you become aroused rather than I need to be aroused and then I have sex. It's the other way around. So that's also something that most people don't realise. For, for a guy... I think a lot of the time is it doesn't matter if he's aroused before or during or after he can he can be turned on like you can wake up in the morning and you know I mean that 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 early morning boner has usually got more to do with stopping you you peeing rather than the need to have sex and um, which is an interesting thing to kind of go oh he's always horny no he's just stopping himself needing to pee because he didn't pee during the night so it's a totally different totally different thing but the boner can make him think about sex which then makes him aroused so it's a different thing but I think um I think that's a lot of a misconceived idea and also I think lovemaking starts with a text message at work you know it starts with I'm thinking about you or I'm missing you it starts with a hand held over dinner it starts with a touch on your cheek that all of those things can make a woman become ready for sex way before entering the bedroom sex for a woman doesn't really start in the bedroom it starts by he took the trash out he left me a little <laughs> note. Seriously, it does because we feel like that person is engaging with our needs and that a man engaging with our needs is the start of sex. It's got nothing to do with engaging with our needs in the bedroom. It's got to do with like a whole holistic menagerie of things. It's got to do with hand-holding and touching. And so, um, so openness and readiness for sex um, is 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 a complex thing but quite often doesn't start with being aroused before we enter the bedroom it's you know starts with 
what happens by the touch of the nape of our neck, the touch on our face, you know. It, but I think for women, we sometimes get worried to engage with that and not be turned on because we feel like we're making a false promise. So in other words, if a man starts engaging with us intimately, touch-wise, we think, oh, God. That means know, something and I'm promising something leads to something else. Yeah, because if I carry on with this and then I don't have sex, then we're going to have a com- we're going to have an awkward conversation. <laughs> so if I carry on, so with much this, thinking. <laughs> yeah, so much thinking. And then I have sex when I don't want to have sex. I'm going to feel lonely afterwards, and I'm going to feel like I let myself down, like I did something I didn't want to do because I out of obligation because I was enjoying the touching and the tenderness and the warmth, but I didn't get turned on, so I didn't want to instigate it. So we block the touching and the tenderness and the warmth because we don't want to make a promise we can't keep. But then that means that we never get anywhere near the promise. So it means that actually if we hadn't been worrying about whether or not we do or do not want to have sex, and we just engage with the touching and the tenderness, but that's down to how safe a guy can make us feel, where he doesn't make us feel bad if we say, look, this has been lovely, but I just want to sleep or I just want to cuddle. And him, he just needs to say, okay, that's fine. Without it becoming Sometimes it's the other way around too. <laughs> yeah, the other way around too. Because people think- assume that guys must one sex every you know night or every time you go on a date and we watch too much you know movies media is telling you this is how they behave oh, we just need to like strip that all down i mean literally. because porn has become the new education you know that's become the new education because you know young guys have such access to it so readily um but you know there are lots and lots of reasons why a guy will have low libido stress definitely um uh, antidepressants can cause it you know that there's lo- there's loads and loads of different things and and sometimes you know they they don't want to either but it's traditionally seen as the woman who who feels like that and i think that that's because for for a woman is it's such a holistic thing it involves the whole of her her mental stability everything Whereas a guy, it can be a very functional thing. So I think, you know, and I don't want to stereotype because everybody is so unique and so unbelievably different. However, there are certain rules of thumb based by our own chemical nature and the difference between estrogen and testosterone, um, you know, that allows a man to be a lot more focused uh, due to testosterone than a woman can be. But then I've met a lot of women with a lot of testosterone, you know, so... You know, you know, yeah. So we're all individual. We are all individual. I'm not. <laughs> so, <laughs> on to piping for you. You know, we all want to be touched and held and hugged and loved and connected and all of those gooey, wonderful, amazing things. And we miss it. You know, we miss it when we're not having that. I always say, you know, if you haven't had sex for a long time, your dragon has gone to sleep, and you go, oh, I don't need it. But it's amazing how it can just be this little trigger and your dragon wakes up and starts breathing fire and you're like, oh, God, you know. <laughs> also, you know, for, for women as well, I think that one of these preconceived ideas is this idea that when women go through the change, you know, um, and go through the menopause, that they stop wanting sex. Bollocks. That's just utter. That's that's not true. Maybe true for some women. But for a lot of women, that isn't true. And I think that, again, that that can be this thing where, oh, well, she's gone through the menopause. But that can also coincide with having been in a really, really long-term relationship where you've had kids together, you've grown together, and you just, there isn't the stimulation that there was there before. Because desire is really stimulated by separation. Hmm. It's not stimulated by togetherness. Desire for somebody happens after you've been apart. It happens, um, you know, uh, after distance. It, desire doesn't happen waking up, going to bed, waking up, going to bed with the same person all of the time. Separation creates desire. So when we look at menopausal women and we go, oh, they lose desire after menopause, they may also be losing desire because of, a, of, of just basically continuous being with the same person without that separation that actually creates the right environment for desire. That's another thing. If people spend too much time together, like couples, maybe they can go off to pursue something that they love doing. And then you have your own separate, you know, passion that that you spend time uh, in doing. And then maybe you come back together for more passion. (laughs) 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, the, the relationship that seem to kind of like keep the sexual um, drive alive longer are people who don't live together. Oh. You know, it's, it, you know, and it's unfortunate because especially nowadays, it's like economically living together is the most sensible thing to do because, you know, you're raising kids, cut, cutting down on overheads, both kids need their parents around. But I think that we need to really think about what works for an individual couple. You know, what works for a family is to have both parents in the same house. Absolutely. But what works for a couple is actually separation and coming together and separation and coming together. That, that's actually really what, what keeps um, the excitement in a relationship alive. So, you know, I think that we, we just assume that we're supposed to want to spend every night sleeping next to somebody, but actually it doesn't always work. For me, my homework would be that when you are curious, you become a sexual being. So this isn't just about when you're in a relationship, but when you're walking down the street, when you're looking at the tops of buildings, not looking for the cracks in the pavement, when you are being curious in conversation, where you ask questions and you're interested, even when you kind of make a comment to your barista about their hair, you know, like it's about being curious to the world around you literally opens your heart it certainly makes you more attractive but also as well it means that you are stimulated by the world around you in every way and when you're stimulated by the world around you the world becomes sexy you become sexy life becomes sexy because sexy isn't just about what you do in bed sexy is a vibrancy of life because sex creates life so it's the vibrancy of life. It's about the, the tangibility of something juicy and the potential of interaction and connection and, yeah, just all of that stuff. So it, it isn't just about kind of like how we go to bed with each other, but how we live with each other um, and not just strangers. You know, a guy or a woman can feel just turned on by somebody who opens the door for you flashing a smile you know, or somebody that you walk past who's shouting down the phone at somebody. Oh my God, I can't believe you're late. What the hell are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And there's a sexiness about it. There's like a <laughs> life, you know, it's engagement of that energy of life, you know. So, so yeah, becoming curious allows that energy of life to flow through you much more dynamically. Mm, love that. Okay, so thank you for all the tips and advice and ideas tomorrow we'll have a last day last day in Becky Walsh week conversation can't wait see you tomorrow see you tomorrow thank you for watching my conversation with Becky Walsh on New York Real Zoom if you would like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her you can email her at Becky at BeckyWalsh.com tell her you are a New York Realer because that will get you extra discount head over to her website, BeckyWalsh.com to see what other services she's offering. During Becky Walsh Week, Monday we talk about the people that we're drawn to meet and how intuition can help us make more instant connection. Tuesday we talk about how we know what we know and why dyslexia can be a gift. Wednesday we talk about how we can spot a lie in this overwhelming world. Thursday we talk about reading your lover, how to use your intuition for a deeper sexual experience. Friday, we talk about raising your value, game, and stepping into your power. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you want to see more of our videos. Thank you so much for watching me at Ruzu. I'm Olive Kui. See you next time. Never gonna love without you. Never gonna fade away. Can we get this shit together?